good morning. Welcome to the Humanist Community of Silicon Valley Sunday Forum. My name is Matt Courtney. I am the re recorder and a member of the board of the Humanist Community. The Humanist Community is a chapter of the American Humanist Association. Humanism is a reality based philosophy of life that affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good. We value freedom, health, happiness, fairness, compassion, and using science and reason to acquire and apply knowledge. If these words describe your thinking, we invite you to become a member of the humanist community if you have not already joined. Membership forms are available on our website at humanists.org. That's humanists, plural, dot org. So Werner Hogg, I hope I pronounced that correctly, has been a member of the atheist community of San Jose since about May 2013. He's the current president. And he will be talking uh, or be giving a review of the book, The Bonobo and the Atheist by uh, Franz de Waals. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. A lot of stuff I got to pronounce. So Werner, all yours, take it away. Um, so first of all, well, uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, appreciate being here. I, I um, imagine that several of you already know a lot about this topic. Um, but, um, and I'd, I'd introduce, let me see, the host has disabled share, screen sharing, is what it tells me. So I, I did not disable screen sharing. I don't know what it's talking about. Let me, let me check some stuff. Well, okay. Oh, there we go. There we go. So just as a bit of a background, I, I have a PhD in environmental chemistry studied at MIT, did some basic research for 20 years or so, then did more applied work. Um, and I'm now semi-retired, but being dragged back into work. Can you try uh, sharing your screen again? I will try sharing my screen right now. Okay. Um, let's see here. So I am a, I am a chemist. So this is not exactly my field of expertise, but uh, I'll do the best I can here. I've read a lot about this. Um, there, there, uh, this started out as a review of The Bonobo and the Atheist by Franz de Waal, but has um, evolved as I've learnt, read more. Uh, other books such as uh, Nathan Lentz, Not So Different, uh, cover similar topics. So I'm, I'm going to, I need to, adjust my screen here so all right uh this was given originally in uh well in february 2016 but i did change it since then um so uh it's a dog eat dog world out there right um <clears throat> animals are driven purely by survival instincts of kill steal deceive cheat anything they can do to survive and uh, humans aren't so different, right? They're, they only differ a little bit in brain power, and we have this uh, a little bit of extra layer of compassion, and we hold some ethical standards. But basically, deep down under, that's that's the veneer theory of human nature. Uh, this is what Franz Saval said that he was taught when he first started graduate studies in the you know 1980s, and started doing studies on chimpanzees and, and observing them. Um, but he came to find that this model doesn't really hold true completely. So um, the, the idea of this veneer theory that it, it, uh, is that we are basically very, you know, bad at the, at the core and have only the sin louder layer and some philosophers have argued that fairness was invented during the French Revolution. So, um, but Deval's idea here is that this goes back much, much later, much earlier. Um, religious texts are just a few thousand years versus, uh, and the 
first ritual human burials are 120,000 years earlier than that. So just to put this sort of in a time scale perspective, uh, we see here that, you know, uh, Islam and Christianity are just, you know, a thousand, a few thousand years old, a few hundred years old. Agricultural development about 10,000 years ago. Human sapiens second wave out of Africa about 60, 70,000 years ago. Earliest evidence of ritual burials um, about 120,000 years ago. And modern humans about 250,000 years ago, and Neanderthals around 450,000 years ago. So, did we really believe that the early hunter-gatherers had no sense of social cohesiveness or empathy or cooperation before the religious texts were written? Well, of course not. They, they, this was one major survival mechanism and one reason that we've spread across the world our ability to cooperate in large numbers. Even Neanderthals have had um, de and demonstrated ability for altruistic behavior, such as, so they found skeletons of, uh, of Neanderthals that had been nurtured into adulthood, even though they suffered from things like dwarfism or limb, limb paralysis, inability to chew, and mental retardation. Um, and so clearly these people cared for their invalids, even these were people who could not really contribute to society and would have been a drag on, on them if it was purely based on survival. So clearly our uh, social group structure and cohesiveness and morality began much, much earlier before religious texts were, were written. Um, this describes briefly uh, what are bonobos. They're a branch of human, uh, uh, of the ape family that uh, diverged from the humans around six million years ago. They're roughly equal on evolutionary scale as the chimpanzees. And they, they kind of walk more upright, more, a little bit more like humans. <clears throat> uh, they're special in that they're less aggressive than chimpanzees, and they use sort of, kind of use sex for all kinds of conflict resolution. And they may meet a group of other bonobos and first be very cautious, but then within a half an hour, they'll they'll all have sex, sort of in group sex. Um, even even adults and children uh, will will do this. Uh, and uh, so th it just seems to be a less aggressive way of avoiding uh, conflicts and resolving conflicts after after a fight. They may even have this kind of interaction. So the point that uh, Naval was making that if uh, bonobos are very similar to uh, humans, then um, perhaps if they're our common ancestor, but we're a little more like bonobos, then our, perhaps our empathy and moral nature is built into us rather than handed down from above. And we we kind of are humans that are, uh, are, are great apes that are more similar to bonobos than other wilder animals. Morality is, is relative. So morality, uh, here are some famous authors who pointed this out. Bertrand Russell, the outside of human desires, there's no moral standard. Uh, Jonathan Figdor, the um, humanist chapel, um, chaplain at Stanford a, a while ago, gave a talk on this, as morality exists only as it is interpreted and viewed by people. Richard Dawkins, paraphrasing from his uh, book, The God Delusion, we, we don't get morality from religion, but from the people around us, and it changes with the zeitgeist of the times. Franz Duval would kind of like to add that morality must fit the species that it is meant for. So if we go back earlier in time, uh, or in the evolutionary pattern, then uh, we must uh, adjust our morality for the species. Um, let's define morality to have a baseline for what we're talking about here a set of social behavioral rules that are followed by either because we feel empathy or, or need fairness and, and pro-social behavior for others, or we fear group punishment if we break them. So
So the, the foundations of morality are characterized by empathy, compassion, consolation, reciprocity, fairness, uh, pro-social tendencies, uh, conflict avoidance, and do no harm kind of ideas. Uh, this doesn't, of course, encompass everything, but, but without these basic concepts, we really can't have a moral behavior. Another way to show this is through this morality pyramid, where empathy and fairness are sort of the two main pillars, um, fairness and reciprocity. And then we have these other uh, more, more added, added descriptors. Um, so getting into the Chimp Bonobo Society, I've, uh, I'm using these kind of interchangeably because I've read so much about them, I, I'm sometimes not sure anymore which examples are chimps and which are bonobos, but they are pretty similar in, in any case. They share food. Um, they, they lick each other's wounds if someone's injured. There's constellation if someone is damaged. And of course, there's fight scoop. So, similar to human behavior. Uh, there's empathy and fairness. Here's an example of a whole structural society, the, the female bonobos, um, and they, I think these are bonobos. They, they, um, the males are strong enough to crack the macadamia nuts with their teeth, but the females are not, and therefore they need this tool to uh, crack open the nuts. So each of these, this is in a preserve, they're given like 10 of them every day, and they have to crack them open, so they have they have this tool here where the, the, this rock is attached to that rock and they can put the nuts down here and then slam on them with and um, they do this in a hierarchical order so the, the top female gets to go first and the second in line goes second and and so on all the way down the you know 10 levels or so and uh, it you know there's Tell to pay if you get out of order or try to get out of order. So they have this whole uh, structural structure within the society, uh, which must be followed. Um, of course, there are disputes, and here's an example of an alpha male mediating the dispute over a food source. So there's both uh, um, desire to comply and also sometimes the need to enforce the rules. Uh, here's another interesting example that, that rape is illegal in chimp society for the most part. If, uh, if chimp females will band together to punish an overly aggressive male who attempts to rape one of them. Um, there's also grooming for bonding and conflict forgiveness. So after, th this is one of the first things that uh, Duval noticed that after a big fight, or for power struggle, uh, two males will will then uh, bond and, and try to uh, rebuild that uh, that relationship. Uh, and this is sometimes done through grooming, because they know that if the uh, if there's too much fighting going on, the structure of the society will break down, and that's not good for anybody for the overall survival of the group. This was an interesting example also. Um, the chimp had actually accidentally bitten off the two fingers of one of their caretakers. And uh, the, um, a little while later, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't get those fingers uh, replaced. And um, this chimp realized what he had done, went off in the corner, was sulking, and was regretful. Um, and then that caretaker had to leave and was transferred, moved to another area. Life, life took its usual turns. Fifteen years later, the same caretaker was, came back and was uh, leading a group through the, uh, this preserve for the, for the chimpanzees. And um, the chimp recognized this lady and came over quickly and was 
trying to look at her hand. So over 15 years later, have not seen this woman for that long, uh, had remembered what she had done, and was again showing concern. So there's this long-term um, understanding of, of, right and, and of right and wrong. That was quite interesting. Uh, some more examples of restraint and conflict avoidance. There's a group of two baboons and a peanut uh, tossed between them, actually two individual baboons, and they both decided it wasn't worth the fight, so they just leave it alone, even though they were both looking to sort of like to have the peanut. Um, two groups of monkeys uh, will found themselves in the same fruit tree, and then they just ran away from each other, leaving the food there just to avoid the conflict. Um, young males will groom an alpha male patiently for a chance to male with the females in heat. So all these things kind of show the ability to control their emotions and have some sense of free will. And so they're not just reacting wildly according to their gut reactions that they want something and must have it and fight for it. They're very, very clearly showing the ability to control their emotions and the restraint and, um, and thus some sense of free will. There's even a, a example here of honoring the dead. This was again in a, in a uh, preserve for the chimpanzees. Um, yeah, I believe these are chimps. Uh, one of them had passed away and they all, uh, they were, the, um, this poor soul was, was brought out to the uh, uh, in front of everyone in this wheelbarrow uh, for these chimps to give their last respects. So there is a feeling and sense that um, people remember the, their past, or, or the <laughs> animals will remember past uh, members of their society and, and still revere and honor them and feel sadness and respect. Whether it goes so far as thinking that they're still alive, I, I'm not sure that we could call this a religion, but there's certainly respect for uh, the dead. Uh, similar things happen with, with elephants. Uh, this, this one cat would sat there mourning his mother's death for four days before it would rejoin the group. Sometimes when the group is migrating, they'll, they'll go out of their way to find old bones of, of past dead, and they'll uh, sort of gather around and feel and touch the, the skulls, in this case, of the bones, remembering, uh, remembering past members. So there's a strong feeling of communal society in a lot of these animals. Here's another example of animal caring. Um, this was an experiment done with chimpanzees. Uh, uh, each chimp is given a box full of, actually, actually no, only, only one chimp is given a box full of tokens. I'm not sure if it's this one. And they, these tokens can be either red or green. And if um, the red token is chosen, then only the chimp who had the tokens gets some reward. Whereas if he chooses a green token, then both get a reward. And they, they can see the other one through the, through the, uh, the cages here. But they're physically separated, so only one of them gets to choose. Um, and, and here's what happens. Of course, if it were purely random, they would be a, it would be a 50-50 pick. Uh, if there's no partner in the group and there's no reason, that the, the chimp would just pick out a token and give any one, and there wouldn't be any difference between the red and green. But if there is a partner present in the cage next to him, and th uh, the partner doesn't do anything, the uh, chimp with the tokens will almost 60% of the time give a, a, a green one, which 
allows the other one to get a reward as well. If the uh, the partner without the without the tokens uh, does a little bit of attention getting, say, hey, uh, you know, I'm here too, then the the amount of uh, shared tokens goes up, the pro social choice goes up, you know, almost ten percent. Um, but if but if he he starts uh, getting demanding and getting mad if he doesn't get anything, then then he, the the pro social activity actually goes down. So he says, well, "If you're not going to behave, I'm not going to help you out this time." So here's an example of uh, a pro social choice that wasn't necessary. Uh, the uh, the chimpanzee with the uh, with the tokens was going to get food anyway, no matter what he did, but he had the option to um, actually help his buddy. And so that's what they do. Um, the same kind of thing has been actually shown for birds. The uh, great parrots, African great parrot, one of the smartest birds in the world, and, and this bird uh, has his, uh, his tokens here. He's passing it on to this other one who can then get a, um, get a reward. So he's actually giving up his food in favor of his other buddy here because he, he can't get one. Um, oh, and here, here's a really good example. I, don't know if, I wonder if anybody's seen this before, but this was, uh, I'll just let Franz de Waal himself speak for himself here and, and and uh, you'll see what happens here. The video is not coming through very well. It's not what? The video is not showing very well. Um, I can't hear it at all and uh, kind of <laughs> jumpy. The video is not showing, huh? The video is showing. It's just uh, choppy, you know. Choppy. Well, and I can't. I'm not hearing the sound at all. Okay. Well, um, let me run it anyway. I guess. Um, okay. It, just to get the visual, and um, uh, I'll kind of explain. Can you hear me while while it's going? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Yeah. All right. I'll I'll try to. Uh, explain what's going on so um <clears throat> he says there now i'm not hearing anything So this was the first test was done with capuchin monkeys. They've not done it with dogs, chimps, and birds afterwards and got similar results. Um, let's see. But right, again, sorry. I'm gonna... So... So he says two monkeys get uh, either, uh, uh, they get either cucumber or grapes. And if you give them cucumber, they're perfectly willing to do that uh, many times in a row. So they're perfectly happy with that if they're just by themselves. So if you to give them grapes, 
He says, if you give them grapes, then there's an inequity between the two of them. So the one on the left gets cucumber, the one on the right gets grapes. Okay. So the first one eats the cucumber, has to give a rock. Cucumber. He eats it. Give the rock. He gets a grape. The other one see the other one sees that. And she gets a cucumber. She doesn't like that. And she wants a grape. <laughs> Like, okay. okay, so I'm not sure if you could see that. Uh, did, did everybody kind of see what happened here? No, could not, could not see it. Okay, well, that's too bad. Anyway, uh, the left one gets cucumbers, the right one gets grapes. When the left one sees that the right one is getting cucumbers, she takes the grape and just throws it right back at the researcher <laughs> to show her disgust that she's being treated unfairly. So, um, and um, in some cases with chimps, they've actually shown that the, uh, the second, in some cases, the second chimp will refuse the grapes unless the other one gets some also. So they really show that the fairness requirement in that case. So, sorry that video it wasn't working. Here's another example of empathy and fairness in rats, even in rats. So, the, 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 we have two rats inside of a larger cage, and uh, inside that larger cage is a smaller cage, and this, this, uh, is, uh, this rat inside here is trapped inside this smaller one. It can be opened through a door in the front. This rat knows how to open it. And in the next cage over, there's a, uh, a bunch of, there's five chocolate chips. Now, a rat will typically eat, on average, about seven chocolate chips. And so, this is not enough uh, for him. Uh, so, um, the question is, what happens, what, what does this rat choose to do? What, is it, what, what does he f choose? Well... He could just go in there and eat all the chocolate chips himself and then think about his buddy. But no, what, what he does is the first thing he does is he goes out and he releases his buddy because he's concerned about his buddy more than about the food. Second thing he does, he'll go in there, open this cage up, and eat, on average, about three and a half chocolate chips. That's half of what he would normally eat. And he leaves the rest for his for his buddy. So this shows even in rats we have an, a, a sense of empathy and fairness. So uh, he he lets his friend out first, and then he'll go eat the eat the top and leave some for his friend. Uh, you know, eating only half of what he would normally eat. So even down as far low as, a, as that level um, in the animal uh, chain, we have empathy and fairness. Even uh, uh, vampire bats will share blood meals. If, if one of them has not been able to eat that night, they'll go out. Uh, uh, some, some will find a meal and some will not. And the ones that are, had a good meal will, will come back and help share their food with those that did not. Um, there's even regulated behavior in social insects. Bees uh, have to work up a social ladder from fanning the hive to, you know, to larval caregiving giving to foraging. And uh, 
the nest for ants, the nest order is maintained partly by instinct, but also by higher status insects doling out uh, rewards and punishment for good and bad behavior, like pinching with the jaws for those who break the rules. Um, I wouldn't really call this morality, but there's definitely some sort of sense of social order and structure in all these, these insects. Even plants uh, share some kind of uh, sympathy or empathy or cooperation with their uh, kin. If you plant plants, two different types of plants in the same pot, they will grow aggressive root systems trying to compete for the water and minerals. Whereas if you plant two of the similar kind, each one of them will, will uh, have a little bit less aggressive root system, showing that they're cooperating. How they know this, I, I don't know, but apparently they can somehow tell uh, who, they're, who they are up against. Um, so there's a biological basis for some of this empathy. I'd have to ask, what was your first reaction when you saw this cut, um, this cut finger? It's immediate shock sometimes, and uh, the, this was um, dis dis uh, understood in the 90, 1990s to be a result of mirror neurons um, that, that uh, will fire in one person when they see pain in another person. So there's a real biological uh, reaction that one person feels for another. Um, they've measured the heart rate of geese increase. So if geese typically mate for life, and when one of the partners gets into a conflict with a third goose, the heart rate of that goose that is not in the conflict will, will increase. So they can measure this. Um, there are other effects like uh, like a uh, mirror, um, what do you call it? Um, um, contagion, yawn contagion, there's smile contagion. And this is, this is known in many animal uh, species. So there's these biological, the observable effects. Uh, here's another one. Adolescent rhesus monkeys like to, like to uh, hold babies. Hold, hold the little babies, and so they'll groom the mother for a chance to cuddle, cuddle the mother, muddle uh, the baby. So even when they don't have one themselves yet, they're too young to have one themselves. So once the mother finally gives up her baby to be cuddled by this adolescent, pretty soon, within five to ten minutes, this adolescent will fall asleep because of the oxytocin release, which can be measured. So doing good feels good. Helping other people feels good. So there's an actual biological um, measurable response in, in many mammals and, and other animals uh, for why uh, helping others is, is good or, or is preferable action. So again, it shows that our morality is deeply embedded in our biochemistry and, and not coming down from the top. Here's some examples of animal altruism. Um, young bonobos will uh, have th this example. They're fetching water for an unrelated uh, female. What they did is actually they don't have any containers, so they would go. They would see this older female walking to the stream trying to get something to drink. That She was having trouble walking, so they would run down to the stream, fill their mouths with water, and then uh, basically spit that water into her mouth. There's an example of an uh, unrelated elephant helping another blind elephant, and they became partners for life and would just sort of sound off to, mean, to uh, make sure they could always stay together. So this one elephant would be leading this other elephant for around, helping her find food and stay with her the whole, her whole life. There are at least 10 cases reported of male chimpanzees caring for unrelated orphans in the, uh, in the wild for several years. Uh, so again, there's no, um, 
connected. No benefit to the male. It's unrelated. No, there's no gene drive here to s support this other uh, orphan chimpanzee. But they do it anyway because it's ingrained in our biochemistry. I read this book called The Girl With No Name uh, by Marina Chapman, who was apparently kidnapped and, and uh, left in the jungle and at age about five, and from five to nine was raised by capuchin monkeys. And um, in this case, she had accidentally eaten some poisonous berries. One of the older uh, monkeys noticed this took her down to the stream and uh, shoved, her, uh, shoved her face into this dirty water. And she thought this, uh, this older monkey was trying to kill her. But then he raised, he raised her face up again and, and she looked into his eyes and could tell that he was trying to help her. And, uh, and so she pushed her down into the, into the water again and this made her vomit. And that helped her get rid of this poison and then led her over to some clean water to kind of wash up and drink some nice clean water. So this is a cross-species altruism. Uh, humpback whales, I've been showing, uh, there's an example of a bunch of humpback whales trying to help a gray whale save a, uh, her calf from killer whales. Uh, and then you can find many, many more examples of you know, animal friendships and and helping each other on, on the internet across various species levels. Dogs will know when they've committed done something wrong. They'll show sympathy and empathy. They know when their when their uh, masters are feeling sad. That sort of thing. There are all many many examples. So why does evolution favor morality? Well, you, of course, it enhances group group bonding and resource sharing improved survivability of the individual. Um, so why favor costly altruism? If you read Robert Triver's work from uh, Rutgers University, he, had, he came up with the concept of reciprocal altruism. So uh, sometimes you help someone uh, now and you might get a payback at a later time. So it doesn't have to be that you're helping someone immediately uh you know you say you're both struggling to survive through a blizzard or a jungle or something and you help each other survive it can be something you do now that uh gets paid back at a, at a later time and this has been shown in in different animals not just humans but in, in chimpanzees and elephants um and you may, you may even, if a third party sees you helping one of the tribe, that third party may help you at a later date. Um, <clears throat> so it doesn't have to be even a direct payback from the same person. So thus, not all these behaviors need to have a, a selfish gene explanation. You know, altruism can be an, an unintended side product. So instead of the the veneer theory, um, Deval proposes the more of the good at the core theory, which is that it's more like a Russian doll, where uh, the uh, a lot of animals can do this sort of basic empathy of state matching, where if one animal is feeling sad, the other one will, will join in. But then there's uh, higher levels, which include like concern for others, uh, abs more abstractly and perspective taking where it uh, the humans are one of the few animals that can really understand uh, different perspectives of how someone might feel in a different situations that they are not in themselves or have never experienced themselves so the point here is that we're good at the core and we evolve different levels of goodness um, and of course, we need to do what we need to do to survive. But uh, beyond that, we still have this basic sense of morality, which is a, a survival mechanism in and of itself. So how does religion fit in? Well, 
uh, his suggestion is that religion and law simply kind of codify this these already existing moral tendencies. So, as a um, as a social animal, we already have moral tendencies. So it's easy to get pulled into religious uh, teachings or have uh, uh, laws and even secular laws imposed upon us because we already want to follow these laws. And they can be modified somewhat by the local leaders or different leaders of different cultures at different times. Uh, so we're, we're already attuned to uh, following these kind of rules because it's already built into us. And it means that atheists should not mock religion, but rather understand that it, it feel, fills this need for security, authority, and a desire to belong. Um, therefore, as atheists and humanists, we need to provide the same kind of societies uh, to uh, have that kind of communal help structure outside of religion. Um, the concept here is that Deval is proposing that the, the um, higher gods or the big gods were sort of invent, invented very, uh, very late in the game, just a few thousand years ago, when we, our cultures evolved into larger groups. So with the advent of agriculture, which allowed us to grow into large societies, we needed sort of these big gods to, to keep an eye on, on everybody. When you're in a, a small hunter-gatherer group of, say, you know, 100 people, pretty much everybody knows everybody else, and there's a lot of peer pressure to, to do the right thing. But when you're in a large group of tens of thousands now, all of a sudden you can uh, pull a fast one on, on someone and then escape into the crowd and, and not be known who, who, is, who it is or who did what. Um, this um, idea is supported by uh, some studies where they show that priming a subject um, with having them read a paragraphs that contain words like God and prophet uh, would make them then later on in a subsequent action behave more altruistic. Um, so, for example, if you're given $10 and you can share some of that with, with the next person you meet, after hearing the words God and prophet in, in your paragraph, you tend, they tended to give a little bit more. Um, but the same was also true of uh, when they read articles that contain words like court and jury. So it's not the specific God or, or thing, it's just the idea, uh, or religion, it's the idea that if someone's watching over you, you're going to tend to act a little bit more favorably towards other people. You have that feeling. And so this might be uh, where the concept of religion uh, developed, or at least the big religions. So to conclude, um, I'd say that even Wikipedia has a morality description that fits this model. Uh, human morality, though sophisticated and complex relative to other animals, is essentially a natural phenomenon that evolves to restrict ex excessive individualism, but undermine a group's cohesion and thereby uh, reduce the individual's fitness. So, um, by um, being part of a group, you get the benefits of that group, but it also means that you have to give up some of, of your individual rights and freedoms in order to cooperate or, or get those benefits. So, thank you. Does the uh, reciprocity uh, go to punishment as well as reward, like if, you know, somebody else is having, uh, or if they do something bad to you, do you, are you more likely to do something bad to them um, if, you know, under certain conditions? And does this not work as well now that the return 
can be so much disproportional to what was done. Like somebody might hit you and you get mad and you shoot them. Whereas it used to be that if somebody hit you, the worst you could do was hit them back. So that our capability have outpaced uh, evolution. Um, so I, I can only speak to the, the, the earlier part of that, really. Um, in, uh, in chimp society, certainly there is that kind of reciprocity of, uh, and then remember, if someone has done something bad to you, and they'll be less likely to help you out or, or, um, and possibly more likely to get into a fight with you again. So yes, there definitely is that. Um, there is a lot of scheming going on <clears throat> of, of chimps trying to gain, you know, power, become the top dog or the top chimp. And so they're, they're always trying to get, uh, people to support them. And this can be done by, grooming and helping the other person the other the other chimp um or helping them if they are in a conflict with the third chimp so uh so yes there, there's definitely that kind of um memory and uh reciprocity that way now in humans whether it's become unbalanced that's a whole i think different different question okay uh, Warner, we, uh, we got a request from the chat mm -hmm. to, uh, can you turn off these, uh, screen share? Okay, sure. That way everybody will be able to see the big grid and we will see yeah. each other's faces. All right. <clears throat> um, and then we'll go on to, uh, hold on, Alex and Senna. Yeah, I had a, a couple observations. One is I saw that, that video of the elephants gathering out the bones of a deceased elephant, and what struck me was the um, narrator saying, we have no idea why they're doing that. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't help but think at the time that, you know, they don't look like us and they don't speak English, but aside from that, they're, they're, that they're acting just like people. And I think... Uh, is maybe too strong a tendency to think that just because they're not human, they don't think like us. Yeah. And there are similar, similar instances where, you know, there are obvious, obviously very human emotions going on there. There's, there's right. a, a video of a, of a, a female lion and cubs coming acro across an injured dog, whether it was a, a, a jackal or whatever. And the female kind of chased the cubs away so they wouldn't bother and just laid down next to it. Really? Wow. And my thought was, yes, she, she recognized their common humanity. Uh -huh. Yeah, interesting. Even though that would, could have been a meal for them. Yeah, yeah. There are other ones of, of female lions adapting and abandoning uh, a deer-like animal and just hmm. taking care of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Until one of the other lions killed it. And, and another example is um, I've heard that crows will, when, if one of theirs has d died, will sort of gather around, um, grab, grab a little twig and place it on the dead animal. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for briefly for, you know, a, a few minutes, and they'll sort of gather around and have this little ceremony. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the, the attitude that, that, they're not like us. Kind of reminds me of the, the argument that they don't feel pain the way we do. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, it's a selfish I, attitude, I think. Right. Very much so, yeah. Oh, I've heard that recently that even fish feel pain, which is, is a sense that you don't really have that they feel much pain, but, but apparently they do. My, my, also, my other thought was about chimpanzees, you know. There are reports of chimpanzees attacking people and attacking other chimpanzees, and they're really brutal. And my, my thought was they're almost human in their sadistic. <laughs> yes. Well, that's true. Robert Sapolsky has mentioned that the humans are very caring, but they also can be very brutal. So this veneer theory is kind of, there's some, something to it. They're both they're, there. They're, they're, they're both there. Everything, both of yeah. 
But I like the theory that uh, that people are basically human. So that therefore, at that core, there would be this this good person, and they would be acted on by nature or nurture or whatever to act otherwise. But basically, that core is good. Yeah. Right. Right. And and it does make sense to me that uh, we we follow our elected leaders because we we already want to look look what's happened with the COVID nineteen. I mean, uh, everybody's out there now policing each other on wearing masks and social distancing, and it's been pretty incredible to me to see the whole world kind of behaving in a similar manner, wanting to prevent the spread of this. Uh, so, uh, yes, there's a few fringe groups who are combating this and want to free up the country, supposedly, you know, let us let set Michigan free and things like that. But for the most part, everyone understands the need to cooperate on, on this level and everybody wants to do it. But a lot of people are taking their cue from the top and if it's like a cult. And that if they're told it's okay to open, they don't care what anybody else says. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well there's both sides and there's always there's always it's a continuum of ideas and you know those who are stressed out more by not having a job will be pushing more to uh, get back into the workplace and those who are maybe like us some of us who are retired and don't rely so much on the, that income then the attitude will change okay i went ahead and, and muted alex and senna I don't see anybody else with their hands up at the moment. Um, I can't tell. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and allow everybody to unmute themselves. So you can unmute yourself uh, if you want to join a general discussion, but please be aware uh, and try not to talk over each other if everybody talks at the same time, or even if only two people talk at the same time. Tends not to come through very well. Uh, I just had a question. I'm relatively new to this group. Is there any way we can get a copy of this presentation if I wanted to show it to some friends? Something? Um, well, um, the earlier version I gave in 2015 is already up on YouTube. Oh, okay. Uh, in in uh, If you Google YouTube... Go to Bonobo and the Atheist, Warner Haig, or ACSJ. Um, you can you can find that easily. So that's probably the simplest way to do it. I'm not sure, Matthew, how this yeah. particular version would now be shared. Are you putting this on YouTube or? Yeah, uh, we're recording this this talk and the questions. We'll probably cut it off before this point, but. Um, yeah, we'll we'll put it up on to YouTube later. We do some editing, so it takes mm -hmm. a little time for us to get yeah. it up there. But it should eventually end up being. I think it's the whole the channel is called the Humanist Community of Silicon Valley mm -hmm. on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's a shorter uh, HCSV, <coughs> uh, but one of the two should be able to find them later on on YouTube as well. Thank you. Alex trying to say something? I, I see his lips moving, but he's muted. There I am. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I want to comment. The, 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 um, when you were talking about uh, religion, the comment that uh, uh, a lot of the idea behind it is that someone is, there's always someone watching you. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting idea. It makes me worry that, that you know, maybe that, that is an important factor in, in, in human society. I mean, a lot of us seem to get along quite well without it, you know. And, and as an atheist, I tend to focus on a, its tribalism or its, its escapism, but there is an, another element in of that, and I'm not sure how to incorporate it. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it, that is a symptom of, of some, uh, like, ADHD, uh, is that mm. they are not aware that people are, are watching what they do. They, they are in a bubble. 
Hmm. Well, it seems to me that uh, the want to having somebody watching is from being maternal. I mean, when you were little, your mom was always looking out for you and making sure that nothing bad would happen to you. And I think people, or at least some people, miss that. They, they want to have a feeling that there is always somebody looking out for them, taking care of them, making sure everything will be all right. But, but that's a different aspect. That's the wanting to be part of a group and be cared for and feel safe, right? But I think what we're talking about here is someone watching over you to make sure you behave properly. Well, mother was also making sure <laughs> yeah. that you didn't, you know, stick your finger in light sockets and things, yeah. right? So yeah. I think that a lot of the impetus for there being a religion uh, may hearken back to wanting somebody to take care of you and look after you and, you know, make sure that you're going to follow your best instincts because I've seen little children reaching for a jar of cookies and they'll look to see whether anybody's watching. <laughs> yeah. They see me watching, they'll pull the hand back, right? <laughs> so, uh, it's, you know, the, and, you know, whereas if there were nobody watching, they might well take the cookies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there was like some uh, studies done a while ago. Don't remember exactly when, but um, do you know those like uh, sometimes they're in in offices and sometimes other places where they have like somebody put like boxes out with like candy or, or snacks or breakfast or something like that, and it's supposed to be like the honor system. You, you if you take something, you're, you're supposed to put money in the little box for it. Uh, well, apparently um, some psychologists found out about these things and, and followed some guys who were, who were doing it at different offices and wanted to, you know, we're measure, measuring how many people were actually like paying for stuff. You can tell based on the price of the things that are being sold uh, and how many are taken out, how many people are actually like, or what percentage of people are actually paying for stuff. And one of the funny things they found was to increase the number of people who would actually pay for it, uh, all they did was they put up a sign with pictures, not like, like a drawing, not even like an actual photo or anything, of eyes. Mm. <laughs> just like eyes, like somebody's watching you. They didn't say somebody's watching you, it was just the picture. And apparently that increased the uh, sure. uh, honesty quite a bit. <laughs> sure, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So the idea of just having someone watching over you um, makes <laughs> makes a lot of sense. Yeah, mm -hmm. I like the idea of, of ancestor worship from that standpoint. You know, it's not just anyone watching; it's, it's your grandfather, your great grandfather. Mm -hmm. They're all watching to see how you're how you're doing. If you're up upholding the family name, I see. Yeah. Well, they're <laughs> older and wiser. You see. <laughs> That was back in the days when we used to think people who got, got wiser as they got older. Yeah. <laughs> Rick Gervais noted that his mother was using God as a uh, all-seeing babysitter. All-seeing babysitter? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm wondering, have... have um, how many of you have seen this uh, or read the book? Have any of you read this this material before? Or was this new to everyone? Or was this sort of stuff everybody had already seen? Judy and I saw Duvall give a presentation on this a few uh -huh. years ago. Okay. Anybody else? Well, I read a little article, so I never saw a whole book on it. Uh-huh. And I've, I've seen, as I mentioned, that, that video of the elephants and some other videos like that. But that mm -hmm. have much the same message. Yeah. Another one I, I was thinking I mentioned before, there was one of a farmer raising pigs, and you kind of associate with the pigs, get along with them, and 
I forget sure. what he was doing, but the pig was annoying him, so he poked it with a stick. Mm-hmm. And the pig went and bit his leg, not, the, not hard enough to break the skin, uh-huh. just to let him know you did something wrong there. Yeah, right, sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I, I kind of got interested in this because of the frequent questions from religious people of where atheists get their morality. And, and um, you know, I, I um, wasn't really a, thinking about becoming a part of an atheist group, or I didn't even know they existed until I read this book about delusion, and where Dawkins reminded or pointed out that we really get our morality from the people around us, how they behave and how that changes with the times how slavery used to be acceptable and now no longer is, and and now gay marriage is acceptable and no longer and it wasn't before, etc. Um, but even much more closer to home, just how your parents behave and your family members behave, that really dr- drives your morality. And I I realized, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, I mean, I I never really read the Bible. I I grew up having some religion early on, but after that, uh, we, we left religion, and, and I never f- found the need to read any religious texts in order to get uh, a sense of what I'm doing is right or wrong. I mean, it just came naturally from everyone around you. And sometimes, like in college, you'd have people who might go steal something, some candy bars, they're a little short of money. And then I found myself gradually thinking, hey, that might be okay. Um, whereas in a different group of, you know, so I might do it myself. Whereas in, in a different group or living at home or if you had plenty of money, then you would never do that. So it, it just depended on sort of the group of people. I could see how morality could shift depending on who you're with and who you grew up with and who you, which culture you happen to be in at, at the moment. Um, so, uh, this sense that our morality changes with, uh, uh, or, or is built into us biologically is, uh, is pretty strong. Um, we had a discussion last week, um, and one of the, about whether moral, uh, whether our, our legal code is a moral code. And, um, I think there's a lot of overlap, uh, so, so yes, our legal code is, is a moral code, but there's a lot of things in morality that are not covered in the, in the legal code. Um, and so people ask the question, of where, where do I get this feeling from that I'm doing something right or wrong? It's just sort of a gut feeling. And I think this being biologically built into us is really sort of where that comes from. I think that uh, morality really isn't black or white. Mm. There's a lot of shades of gray, and you talked about, you know, stealing candy in college, and you think of the, you know, poor student and the university that's got lots of money, Mm. and it makes it easier to take a piece of candy, whereas if you're, you know, with other impoverished people, you'd be less likely to steal from them. Mm -hmm. Well, I I agree with Kenita about, you know, most mothers spend a lot of their time doing conflict resolution and, you know, trying to be fair with a group of children. Years and years and years of that. And I think people are just conditioned, mostly by their parents, especially their mother, to, to do things so that they won't uh, get in trouble. They won't get it, you know, they won't steal, they won't kill things, they won't make a mess. And, and, and I think mothers spend years and years and it seems to come naturally to them. All kinds of mothers, cat mothers, dog mothers, human mothers. So I think that's where most people learn a lot of their behavior. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think also if you're, you're talking about human nature, you know, human nature is to grow up among other people. You, you, you can't separate it. You can't, you know, if, if you grew up without the influence of other people telling you what's right and wrong, that wouldn't quite be natural. 
That's true. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if it, it, there's a book by Thomas Sello called uh, Becoming Human, and uh, it, a lot of these things are developed very early on, before the age of one or two. So it, it, is, it is observed mostly through interaction with parents and adults. So young, very young children, before the age one, interact more with adults than they do with others uh, of their own age. And so they pick up the cultural uh, ideals or language uh, and behaviors very, very early on through these types of interactions. So before they were actually taught uh, in a you know in a language f format when they're age five and they can rationally understand it, they they pick up on a lot of these things much earlier. Well, there is a tendency when people come like you, if people see that that. I did elder care for a while, and you could not, you know, people felt that you have so much, you won't miss any, and especially things that were stored in a garage or something. We bought a beautiful lavender dress for one elderly lady, so she'd have something nice to wear. It took about two weeks for that to disappear out of her closet. So mm -hmm. people should be aware that they should, they should be aware of the possibility that somebody who has nothing is going to be tempted by all that stuff you've got. Mm -hmm. Sure. You're getting grief since then. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. She had the grapes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All righty. Oh, I we still uh, get that thing about not growing up alone. There was a comment in some nature show where the guy was commenting that he's talking about monkeys and they're the brains, and most primates, you know, they're, a lot of their brains are, are dedicated to dealing with others of our kind. And he said a, a, a solitary monkey is only half an animal. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. I wonder what morality means if you're an individual on an island. Yeah. You, you talk really... to that, that, that dog. <laughs> right. I mean, you can walk around naked or, or whatever. And this is a lot of morality like wearing clothes that may not have any practical social significance, but mm -hmm. it's what we do when we want to be part of the group. Mm -hmm. I wonder how much of, of religion is, is, is in bonding. We say we believe this thing that no one else believes, therefore we're a tight group. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the... Each each culture has its own set of moral rules, languages, and behaviors. So there's, I I believe firmly there's no such thing as absolute morality. Uh, can be objective once you set a set of rules. You can decide if people have violated those rules. But uh, I don't think there's much of an absolute standard. There are, there are basic standards that are go across cultures. The general idea of not stealing and not, not hurting others is common, but the details of those vary a lot. Yeah, I think it's a, a matter of, you know, we all have a sense, most of us, I, I think all of us have a sense of morality, and we, we try to set, when we, we start making up rules, the rules are, what, what do you do in these circumstances? Mm -hmm. And you're always going to miss something. Right. You know, it's, it's like when you call the helpline and they say, is your problem this or this or this, and it's mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. And when you make that a law, you, you, it's even more abstract. You know, at the risk of bringing up an odd uh, observation, I can't help but think what Jesus said <laughs> when the rich man complained that his servant had stolen from him. And, the, and Jesus said, well, where was the gold? It was, it was out in, on the table. And this terrible servant stole it from me. Jesus said to him, you know, you are just as guilty in that as he is, because you tempted him and left your possessions out where he could take them. And he was poor and he needed them. So it's interesting to speculate about where the, the fault lies in, in these situations. I had a situation like that where I, I, had a, I was at a hotel 
and I left a ring, um, an amethyst ring on the on the dresser. I, I I was very naive at the time, and when I complained to the to the uh, establishment that that they had stolen the ring, they said, "Well, where was it?" It was I left it on the dresser. And they said, what did you expect? <laughs> Yeah, I like, I like the, the the motto "property is theft," but I I don't want to live that way. I like my property. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like the thing about, about the, the English language, I, I know. Remember when I was thinking of Spanish? They talked about when you're earning money. The the word verb is ganar, but it also means to win. And in English, I think we have a sense that if we've earned the money, it means we deserve it, rather than just it's what they're willing to give us. You know, besides uh, empathy and all those things that we love in animals and in humans, uh, competitiveness is also there and very important. And uh, I'm reminded that uh, anthropologists you know, found that people a few thousand years before the Christian era uh, wanted to build families because the, uh, in a group, if your family was bigger, you were more powerful. Mm. And the, consequently, you try to produce more children, but also, if not, you encourage your children to marry within the family and of mm -hmm. course we know nowadays the problems with that and in, in the early uh christian eras before a marriage the, the the statement was asked does anyone know if these people are related that later got changed some hundreds of years later to does anyone know why these people shouldn't be married and that carries some other moral consequences but it's very interesting once you said that you can't get married if you're related all of a sudden, people became more interested in people outside their family, and uh, we today have no problem making friends with strangers or or being friendly with them. But uh, you you got to believe that uh, thousands of years before the Christian era, people were much more competitive, and uh, uh, families were who in the hell you counted on and who you thought would have empathy for you. Mm -hmm. It looks like uh, Greg in the chat asks if uh, bonobos allow their leader to be above the law or if everybody's treated equally there. Um, I, I think the answer is no. Um, it, in all of these societies, the, uh, your, your time at the top is, is, can be short. And, and you, you need to constantly be maintaining your your relationships and be be friends with everyone so once you start um deviating from that too much then you'll be kicked out by the next guy too bad so, it doesn't work in human society <laughs> it, yeah <laughs> it shouldn't i think i think bonobos would wear a mask if they were asked to wear a mask the group <laughs> I'm visiting a medical facility. Yeah. Go ahead, Susan. Uh, yeah, I just uh, came from a Unitarian group meeting um, right before this, and I just want to put this out there. I'm not going to explain it or go into detail, but his, one of the participants said, if I don't believe in good or evil. It's really social or antisocial. <coughs> and I think this is... <coughs> relevance to what you guys are talking about here um, and just wanted to hear what you guys say well anything I, I mean uh, if you think about cross um, cross species morality that that helps put a perspective on it I think so um, if you kill if you shoot the neighbor's dog it's probably most people would not think that that's a good thing to do. And I don't know if that really is social or antisocial. Um, let me think another example. Uh, so you, you have this sense that you want to do well or good for uh, the planet. You, you don't want to chop down a tree if you've if you've had the big oak tree in your yard for many years, uh, I think 
there's there are things that go beyond social and non-social. For, for yeah, me, they're strongly related. More, for me, it's more ethical. Um, the word ethical is important. Um, yeah. And you build life on ethical values. Mm -hmm. Sure, like stem cell research, abortion. I'm not sure these things are really. I think they're more ethical questions rather than social questions. I like the phrase you're talking about. Morale. I like the phrase "play fair" because mm -hmm. it leaves room for competition. Mm -hmm. You know, but it still implies that you treat others with respect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. All right. I seem to have beaten it to death here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think. Uh, right. Before we run off, uh, I think Susan, she, I think she's muted, had a question for the group in general, not exactly on topic. Um, I don't know if she's joining. Um, actually, this question is more um, for Roy, who's trying to get up and leave, but it's really his answer, asking the question, if anybody wants to talk in the future. Uh, not at this meeting, but um, future sessions or talk phone or video conversations about epidemiology. Epidemiology. I can't even say the word. Epidemiologists. Epidemiologists and the uh, solutions for COVID stuff. Well, uh, yes. Uh, one thing. Um, I there are some period. Uh, what do you call it? So, Par paradigm shifts. There are two paradigm shifts that I like to talk to, find out how to connect to epidemiologists. But uh, uh, just th this is one little bit of information. I recently talked to my uh, ne nephew down in Los Angeles, and he Look said, at the screen. "He said, Look at the screen. I don't want to." He said that. Uh, um, his his son, which would be my great nephew, uh, caught the virus and was all ready to go to the hospital. Very serious. His doctor said, "I'll try one more thing. I'm going to prescribe uh, a cho chloral chloroquine." Hydrochloroquine. It's the same, Susan. Okay. And uh, uh, within 12 hours, uh, he didn't have to go to the hospital. But during that time, within a couple of days, his wife, uh, which would be my great uh, uh, grandniece, uh, said, I'm going to try. There was some drug left over, and she tried it, and she didn't have to go to the hospital. So my nephew, which is, you know, the, the father of the two, uh, uh, said that I'm going to take, find a way to get that. So. The statement that says uh, from the epidemiologist that uh, chloroquine has no effect is bullshit. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, you can always uh, go on individual cases, and, and sometimes it may help. Uh, the question is whether the safety is of it is good enough to uh, prescribe on broad cases and whether these two cases you know you can't extrapolate from from two cases to a general there are lots of reasons why the, the uh, disease may go away by itself so it's it's certainly um i mean both, yeah, the, are, both are possible yeah the so timing you, was, the timing was too close it had nothing to well, do with Pro probability. It was very effective. Now, uh, they won't say that uh, possibly due to people's very different uh, responses to the virus, some are, don't even know they had it. Uh, I think that all they, they could say that once in a while it may be effective, but you have to balance the risk. They said you can't balance the risk, it's useless. And that's, as I say, bullshit. So stay tuned, please. Well, 
Yeah, I don't think anybody here is like an infectious disease specialist, and I'm really uncomfortable uh, with this on my Twitch channel, if I'm going to be perfectly honest. I get that. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to leave. Well, Roy, speaking to your, your previous point about, you know, talking about uh, epidemiology and stuff like that, not really talking about it, but next week we'll have a speaker talking about the statistics of diagno diagnostic testing, uh, which is in the same ballpark there. Not specifically about COVID-19, though, uh, but uh, should be interesting. And I know the guy, so uh, <laughs> should be interesting. <laughs> Okay, thank you. There was another question or comment in the chat. Um, another one from Greg. I don't know why he's not asking them. Did you want to ask <laughs> it directly, Greg? <laughs> well, I just was wondering um, whether the various moral behaviors of bonobos can be categorized according to Jonathan Haidt's categories. And uh, that might also be a way of identifying which moral categories could be described as social or antisocial and which ones have uh, more of an individual nature. I guess I'm not familiar with those categories, so I can't really speak to it. But, but of course... Uh, the cognitive levels of different animals are going to be different, so it, it'll be difficult to categorize them. Uh, the bonobo categories according to human uh, human guidelines. And anybody else have a better, more information or understanding of the hates categories? Well, it would be an interesting area for someone to. Um, try to uh, try to contrast the particular bonobo behaviors observed and, and apply the categories and see how they just differ. Can you, can you list a few of the categories? The, the categories I put in the chat. Uh, he, he calls it care, fairness, loyalty, authority, and sanctity. And he uh, has a survey where it gives moral dilemmas and people answer those and it uh, gives you a profile of how important you rank those different uh, categories. And mm -hmm. there's a distinction among how you rank the various categories and how you self-identify politically. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. One of the things I found frustrating was that he didn't consider honesty to be a uh, moral category mm -hmm. or to be significant. Um, although his methodology is interesting, he, he, gathers his assessment of moral views based on uh, how a variety of people in a variety of cultures respond to moral dilemmas. I, I would say the first four are, are pretty strong in the middle of society. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what sanctity... Sanctity derives from taboos, essentially. What, what you find is poisonous or uh, harmful and it becomes enculturated as um, uh, taboos or... Uh, yeah, not sure about that one. So it's, it's kind of kind of watch your language, I, I would think, would be under that category, too. You know, there's certain way, words you just don't use in public. Well, you do now. Society's changed a bit. But it used to be you'd be scolded for saying things like that. I did want to mention a related book, uh, Jared Diamond's uh, The Third Chimpanzee, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, is worth a read if people are looking for something in this area. Mm -hmm. Where does the name The Third Ch Chimpanzee come from? Well, it's actually referring to humans, but it discusses chimpanzees, bonobos, and humans, and how they're similar and how they're different. And uh, It's... Um, I, I found it an interesting read. There's even a children's version of it. Um, and there's another author, Robert Sapolsky, who's done quite a bit of uh, both. Uh, he's at Stanford. He's done research in Africa for many years, and, and now 
is a he's a neuroscientist, so he's he's um, pretty insightful. He has a recent book out. Um, can't remember the title, but it was written just last year. It just came out. Some pages on, on the whole idea of human behavior and characteristics, uh, going all the way from, uh, 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 the evolutionary development up to the social structure of why humans behave certain ways. Um, I wish I had a book. Well, I, I hope to get this added to the our book group's uh, list of books we might choose in a future um, for a future read. I think I started reading it last night, and I thought it was quite interesting. Yes. That is the bonobo and the atheist. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's quite interesting. Yeah. <sighs> I would point out that the humanist community is organized as a nonprofit religious organization. Mm -hmm. And um, our views are that um, we can serve the function of religion without dealing without uh, um, depending on the supernatural so it's a naturalistic religion so so does that mean we're now in you're an essential business and can <laughs> I have meetings i'll be passing out the collection plate <laughs> well, that's usually my job but um in fact um, i'll put in the commercial and if you have or if you're not in dire straits and want to donate to the humanist community please send a check to our mailing address or go on to the website and see how you can donate that way. This treasurer's spot there. Okay. Oh, thank you, Greg. Do, do you guys do other philanthropy activities? And um, I guess you, you guys know Hank, Hank Pelletier and yes, his yes. stuff in yes. Africa and such. Yeah, right. He does very interesting work. Yeah. We, uh, we had a very active social action committee, but uh, it seems to have, <laughs> the person who was in Rock Club has moved on to uh, other activities within mm -hmm. our group. Mm -hmm. But we still have a few things that we do contribute to, like, uh, um, uh, what's this called? Did you see? What? Did you see? Yes. Well, I don't remember the name of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, there is a group called uh, that 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 it, ha it has open house and helps uh, ch uh, young people who have who have mostly um, aged out of the uh, mm -hmm. place where they are entitled to some kind of help, and mm -hmm. um, so we do that. And what they want now is socks. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to run social action stuff from your home, though. Yeah, well, Hank does a pretty good job of that. I mean, he, he does go and visit Africa and visit the facilities, uh -huh. but but he's... I, I wonder if that's changed much now. Does he have to wear gloves and a mask? <laughs> uh, over the internet, you mean? No. <laughs> right. So it's not the Hank? Well, no, he hasn't... Um, Yes, I, I went to Africa with him a few years ago, um, and he ha he hasn't been traveling back to Africa uh, in a few years now. But um, I think he has plans to go back as soon as this is over. Uh -huh. We we have to build. Uh, I, I'm a member of his group, actually, the Humanist Global uh, Charity. Um, so I'm on the board there, and, and um, he spread out his activities to other parts of Africa and uh, wants to visit some of them. Um, but we have to have people on the ground there that we trust to implement the, these things. And, and he tries to keep the, each of his uh, projects kind of small so it doesn't attract the big scammers. And you, ha you can have a little a bit of... Um, more control and you know you, you get some money for solar panels for example or a water tank and that's sort of a sm small thing costs a few hundred dollars maybe a few thousand dollars at most uh, to, to implement and then they'll provide you 
with uh, reports and showing that it's actually been done. You know, we've had Hank actually speak to our group right. multiple times. Yeah. He, always he was did. one of he was one of the final people to speak before we had to um, go yeah. online. Right. Well, he he's the one that suggested that I contact you guys for for giving a presentation. Yeah, I have to thank him for that. Yeah. Yes. The the name of the uh, of the group is Stand Up for Kids. Oh, okay. And it's in, it's all over, but there is one in San Jose. Yep. And probably closer. Mm -hmm. um, well, we also have a have an ongoing relationship with with um. Say it, say it. You just mm -hmm. told me what it was. <laughs> well, anyway, they make they make uh, oh, in stove in stove. They make stoves for for special stoves that get them out of all, working and all that smoke and things while they're carrying babies. So oh, yeah. it's a really good thing that he's doing that. Nice, yeah. All right. Um, I, I need to go take care of some other things. Well, thank you. So, thank you. Yes, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right. All right. Nice. nice speaking to everybody. So appreciate, and um, we'll see you around again. I'm sure. Oh, good. We look Thank forward you. to it. Okay. Okay. Well, I guess I'm going to sign Is off. It, Everybody's uh, leaving. Quick aside, uh, Alex. Please, yes. please remember to organize the board meeting Monday night. Yes. Yes. Uh, I discuss it with Matt, and I'll send out. Uh, and updated, although I don't know if it's changed any agenda tonight. And I'll resend your uh, uh, financial statements from last week. Okay. I'll have to reschedule and, and send out the info for the board meeting. Okay. Um, okay. Zoom meeting. So mm -hmm. Seven o'clock tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, online. And I, I suppose it's, it's open to members of the humanist community. So if you're interested in getting some space, email me and I'll uh, uh, send the um, instructions on how to get online to you. Okay. All right. Matthew, thank you for uh, running the show. Uh, you're thank welcome. You. Yes. To do it. I just want to point out, I think it's kind of funny, my window over here points out to the, uh, the pool area of my apartment complex. And I'm suddenly seeing a bunch of people over there. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't oh. think that's social distancing. <laughs> uh. They're definitely not wearing a mask if they're in the pool. <laughs> it's a chancy deal that's going on. Yeah. Yes, I, I saw. I've kind of given up on it. A, a, a former executive of several companies bought a full page ad in the Mercury News yesterday. And, uh, rather aggressively tried to demand that Dr. Cody open up Santa Clara County. It's yeah. very uh, disturbing that there were some legitimate questions and the editors of the Mercury News Today also asked about what is the plan to get the capacity for testing and tracing. And that does... I think the key is having that capacity exceed the infection rate. Yeah. Yes.